You are listening to It's All Relative, the podcast that takes a good hard look at crime and the family. Welcome to episode three in our discussion of Tupac Shakur and Christopher Wallace. Please take note of that phrase, part three, and go back two episodes and start there if you haven't been listening along already. I, your host, am not great at curbing my fucking mouth. So, if you haven't already figured it out, this is in no way a PG-rated podcast. If you continue listening, you are doing so under your own recognizance. Tupac will get you in the proper mood for what's to come, and I will see you on the other side. Sickness. I brought my adversaries, but slipped and left the witness. Wonder if they'll catch me or will this nigga snitch? Should I shoot this bitch or make the nigga rich? Don't wanna commit murder, but damn, they got me trapped. Walking while I'm walking and talking behind my back. I'm down to schizophrenic. I'm in this shit to win it. Cause life's a wheel of fortune. It's my chance to spin it. Got no time for cops who trip and try to catch me. Too fucking trigger happy to let them suckers snatch me. Niggas getting jealous. jealous. Trying to find my stash. Rip out the nine. Now I'm a dime off your ass. Peter picked a pepper, but I could pick a pump. Sass him like a bitch and threw him in the trunk. The pump thought I was bluffing. Was swam nothing nice. Before I take your life, first wrestle with these mics. I listen to a scream. In the previous episode, we left Tupac on a bus to California. He had spent two years at the Baltimore School for the Arts, and despite his amazing talent, he had been about to fail due to his not doing any of his assignments. So his mother, Afini, sent him to join his sister in California. Afini knew a few prominent members of the Panther Party out in that state where the party was founded. Such had gone out for a summer visit, but she had decided to stay and enroll in school. Afini took Tupac's situation at the art school as a sign that it was time to leave Baltimore. So Tupac was off to Marin. The most telling thing that happened in this move was how he treated his friends in Baltimore. He just left. From the authorized biography, quote, Tupac left Baltimore without saying goodbye to any of his friends and classmates. There were no going away parties and no farewell conversations. He didn't tell anyone in person that he was leaving. Jada remembered. He literally got up in the middle of the night and bounced. He never said goodbye, and that was devastating. Getting that letter, though, I think somebody gave it to an English teacher. I can't remember who he gave it to, but some kind of way he gave it to an English teacher, and I got the letter. He apologized, and once he got settled, he called and wrote. End quote. And if you are wondering, that Jada is Jada Pinkett, eventually Pinkett Smith. She and Tupac had become very good friends at the Baltimore School for the Arts. And the fact that he didn't, or maybe couldn't, say goodbye says a lot about how unstable his life had been up to that point. Once Tupac arrived in Marin City, he wasted no time in making friends. Again, he stuck his nose in every rap session and house party he could find. It didn't take long for people to see that Tupac not only had the gift of rap, he also had a deep knowledge of history that always dotted his conversations with pieces of the past. It also didn't take him long to form a rap group called One Nation MCs, or ONE for short. Along with his talent and his profound knowledge came an almost innate disdain for the police. This did not pose a common problem until he moved to Marin City. Marin was rich like uber rich. It still is, but on the southern end of the county, not horribly far from the Golden Gate Bridge, is the odd duck of poverty and a whole lot of brown people. Cops would drive through on patrol, looking for something to do. Tupac was always ready when they drove by with a steel gaze, and he was primed to rage at them, should they come too close. As part of the One Nation MC's ensemble, Tupac had medallions made, one day, Tupac was waiting for the city bus, and the police patrol came slowly crawling by. Tupac immediately started mouthing off, and the police didn't hesitate to run him in. They kept asking him what gang he was part of, and refused to believe that his one medallion was a part of his rap group, not his gang affiliation. They finally let him go when they could find no indication of a gang named One. A few months later, Tupac had gone to visit a friend a good half hour away. It was the second night of a play, Othello, and Tupac had scored the lead. 
On his way back to the theater, he overheard someone call someone else a nigger, and that was it. The fight that followed meant that Tupac missed his connecting bus. There was one similar instance in Baltimore. Tupac's cousin Scott came to visit, but no one had mentioned Baltimore's strict open liquor policies, as in no open liquor in public. Scott opened a beer standing on the sidewalk while waiting for someone. The police came and asked him to dump it out, but they did not tell him why. Before Scott could even discern why, Tupac showed up, demanded an explanation, and insisted the cops leave him alone. But because of Tupac's angry tone, what could maybe have worked out without a trip to the station, resulted in a trip for both Scott and Tupac. Quote, Even with the lure and excitement of Tam High School's reputable drama department and the promise of honing his craft, on many mornings Tupac decided to forego the bus trip to Mill Valley and stay in Marin City, feeling as though he had enough math and science by then and rapidly losing faith in the school's overall curriculum, especially in the history department. His primary focus shifted to finding ways to make money and survive. On one of those mornings, he walked past a white woman sitting in the expansive dry grass field between Hayden's liquor store and the local elementary school. She was reading Winnie Mandela's memoir, Parts of My Soul Went With Him. Oh yeah, that's a good book, Tupac said, giving his approval. The woman was Lila Steinberg, an educator who lived in Santa Rosa, a town 45 minutes north. Lila spent her days commuting to public schools across the Bay Area to stage cultural awareness assemblies in connection with Youth Imaginations, a multicultural education nonprofit. Once again, Tupac's reputation preceded him. After a moment, Lila realized she had seen him briefly on the dance floor the night before at a local nightclub. Let me come and check it out, he said after class, and the two walked out together. Tupac shared his thoughts. Intrigued by his blunt assumptions and captivated by his charm and curiosity, Lila invited him to a poetry circle she was hosting at her home later that afternoon. Tupac accepted, end quote. We heard a knock on the door, and I was like, oh, God, the cops are here again. So I go, and I open the door. I was like, yes, officer. He said, we've had more complaints. The music is too loud. And so I was like, I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't want any problems. And here comes Pac over my shoulder, really sarcastic. Oh, what's up, officer? You have problems? The neighbor's rock music is just as loud. You don't give them shit. And I was looking at him like, please don't start any more problems. I keep having problems already, you know, ever since you got here. So he was like, well, officer, stay right there. Don't go. I want to change the volume and make sure that you think this is okay. So he runs over to the stereo and he puts um, NWA, fuck the police. And he turns the volume up just loud enough, but not too loud for the officer to stand at the door and listen. He was like, listen, you know, officer, let me know if this is too loud. And that was Lila in a documentary called Thug Angel, The Life of an Outlaw. As usual, Tupac made friends of everyone in the poetry circle. He and Ray quickly became inseparable, and the two began recording together. They named themselves Strictly Dope. Around the time Tupac turned 18, three things happened. First, he dropped out of high school to focus on his performance art. Second, his connection to the former Panthers resulted in several influential people in the current activist groups taking notice of Tupac's potential as a leader of the new African Panthers. And third, Tupac got word from Afini's neighbors that she was deep in a downward spiral of crack. Checking in at the rental Afini and Sechua called home revealed that things were really, really bad. He called his aunt Jean for help, and soon Sechua was on her way back to New York followed by Afini. The very first day we met, he ended up coming from Marin City to this place with me that same day, and we did our little workshop here that night. And then from that night on, he was part of our group. He thought I was like the perfect package to get him where he needed to go. He told me what was going on at his house, and within a couple months, I realized that his mother was so addicted that his house was too dysfunctional to have a career to keep going to school. So within a couple months, he ended up coming to stay at my house. 7465 Bridget Drive. And this is the apartment that I was living in with my husband and my children. And Pac and Ray came to stay with me here. He was the sloppiest, messiest person I've ever lived with. And dirty. He would never want to wash clothes. He'd want to, like buy new clothes so he wouldn't have to clean up and wash stuff. At 17, he was wide-eyed 
and really believed that he could change the world. That comes from Hip Hop Brilliance. Quote, Without the distraction of school filling his days, Tupac was able to spend his time making plans for the future. He needed to find a way to make money, but he also sought to make his message heard through his music and his new role in the New African Panthers. He wanted a platform from which to launch his pronouncements and broadcast his concerns for the young black men of America, a place from which to ask the world to listen. His rap career became his life. He bought Donald Passman's book, All You Need to Know About the Music Business, and studied it, focusing on the chapter titled How to Pick a Team. Following the book's prescribed steps, he assigned Lila the responsibility of being Strictly Dope's manager. I'm going to tell you what you're going to do and how you're going to sell me, he told her. Lila also reached out to one of her business associates, Bay Area native and owner of TNT Management, Atron Gregory. Atron liked what he saw, but he told Lila that before he made any decisions, she needed to bring the group to meet with one of the artists he managed, Gregory Jacobs, a.k.a. Shock G one of the forces behind the digital underground. This right here is the first hall that Tupac performed in. And it was the Craft, EC Craft Community Building. And Pac did this with Digital Underground, Pack the Place. I had talked to Atron and I wanted to get us a deal. And he said we had to make a video. We decided to have our own mini concert here on the grass so that we should, could show Atron how tight we were. And so all the kids in the building were our audience right here on the grass. And that was the stage behind the trees. And we had the Strictly Dope show. And this is where we made our tape that I sent to Atron that got Pac's deal. Tupac's first meeting with Shock took place at Starlight Sound, a recording studio in Richmond, California. Tupac could hardly contain himself. When he and Lila arrived at the studio, Shock G, a tall, slender, handsome brother with light brown skin and an afro, sat at the mixing board. Tupac walked right up to him, confident, all business. You ready? Years later, Shock still remembered being impressed with Tupac's style and diction. It was street, it was educated, it was articulate, like hip-hop fantasy type stuff. A spy looking for his mic. On August 2nd, 1989, just weeks after Tupac's 18th birthday, management contracts were drawn up and signed with Atron's company, TNT Management. End quote. There was a fight for Tupac's soul, so to speak, at the time he got his contract, between the people behind the New African Panthers and the people behind his music career. Tupac was considering moving to Atlanta, where the main hub of the Panthers was growing. Digital Underground was going on tour, and the music side of his life knew that they would have to send him on tour as well, or they just might lose him to Atlanta. Back in Brooklyn, Christopher Wallace is finally getting noticed by people in the industry. This wasn't the first time someone had sent something in him. A jazz musician named Donald Harrison had moved himself into Chris's neighborhood to be around hip-hop influences of the time. What he discovered was this really gifted kid named Chris. Donald Harrison was a young jazz artist. When we were younger, they happened to live on the block. He would see Donald coming in with beautiful ladies and with the horn. And before I knew it, he would say, yo, I met him. Sounds something like that, man. Yeah, I play with Art Blakey. Miles Davis and Lena Horn. Clinton Hill at that time was becoming a place where a lot of musicians and artists were doing things in that neighborhood. So I figured I should be there too. Well, the jazz musician used to live on my block, on St. James, and the side was real cool. So I used to come by the house all the time. I was being helped by older musicians who were nurturing me. One of the things that they told me 
which was in my heart anyway, was to pass it on. With Chris, I did a lot of different things. Go to the movies, the Museum of Modern Art, explaining Picasso and all those guys and the difference between different eras of painting. And he would be a sponge to just so much more that was outside of our scope as, as young kids. I was initially trying to groom Chris to be a jazz artist because he was so talented. One of the things that we worked on was putting what a snare drum did in bebop drumming into the rhythm of a rhyme. Listen to Max Roach with Clifford Brown. Max has a very melodic way of playing the drums. He makes the rhythm into a melody. So if you slow one of those ideas down, like put some lyrics to that, you can hear that the Tories B.I.G. was accenting those notes and rhyming in a way that exudes all the finer qualities of a bebop drum solo. It's incredible. Huh, I'd rather make a buck, drive a fat ass truck, drag the nine, two clips, and run amok. Yes, flex after two or three bets as I wreck shit. What the fuck you expected? A fly guy? Well, fuck it. I'm a high guy. From bed, stop putting the swelling on your eye. You know, Steven, when I choke me, you stop breathing. But police come, I'm leaving. Peace and love. Here we go. And that clip was from Biggie, I Got a Story to Tell, on Netflix. Big even made a demo at 14. Here's Hubert Sam talking about their early teens. Chris wanted to make our first recording. MC Quest was his name at that time. And we found a studio downtown Brooklyn called Funky Slice. And we had to get permission from our parents, of course. We put together allowance money. And we're in Brooklyn today at Funky Slice Studios. We're going to show you how to make a demo tape, how you can do it, how you can get that record out and get that deal going so you can get paid. He made a song over the Toto Africa beat. So his skills were not only in lyrics, just vision for songs. I hear the drums are growing tonight. I'm looking at my bills, looking at my walls, echoing my head saying I got a lot of balls. Flipping my cap, cutting my teeth, picking up my girl said she called me a thief. She said I stole her heart. I told her I was sorry and she said get out my face. But kids in Brooklyn tend to live their whole life within a few blocks of their childhood home. Young Chris could only see what was happening in front of his face, on the corner and on the stoop. He let the dream of being a rap star fade into the ether and he started working on something that seemed more realistic, being a drug lord. But Chris went down to Damien's end of the neighborhood to meet 50 Grand. And Chris had that rap battle with Preem impressing 50 Grand enough to introduce him to Mr. C. Mr. C is a music producer and radio personality, and Mr. C had to call Matt, a.k.a. Matty, from Source magazine because Big's demo was so good. This landed Big a feature in Source, and Matty also thought the demo was good. So good, he had to make Sean Combs listen to it, better known as Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, or simply Puffy. Sean Combs is a record producer who was working for Uptown Records at the time he heard Big's demo. When I got the call from P. Diddy, Puffy at the time, uh, do you have any new material? I brought the tape up. When I heard it, I was like, what the fuck? I was like, I, I, I was like, thank you, God. It's one of the greatest MCs I've ever heard. This is during the time of LL Cool J. Everybody's like having to be sexy, light skin, extra pretty, lips moisturized. I think Big's lips was a little cracked. He looked like he was just out in the street hustling. And I was just calling Mr. C, who had Brooklyn on lock and knew everybody out there. I was from Harlem, so I couldn't just like go over the bridge and be going in the neighborhoods and asking for Biggie. You know, Harlem Cats is always known as being the flashy, the gloss. And, you know, where and we Brooklyn come from in Best Eye, you know, we, we, this is hood. Because I didn't really know the streets of Brooklyn. I knew the streets of Harlem. Nobody went to Best Stuy because you was just going to get robbed. The first meeting was with me, Biggie, 
and Puff. I never forget it was a winter day. I don't remember what month it was, but it was winter. We both had on winter jackets on. It was cold. We go upstairs, you know, see the receptionist. We're here to see Puff. We go in his office. No sooner do we sit down, Puff asked Big to kick a rhyme. He's like, yo, I want you to kick a rhyme for me right now. Because the demo tape was so good, I almost didn't believe that he could be this nice. I, I see this rawness when he freestyles in front of me, but it's still, it's great. It's like, it's, it's 48 bars of pure fire. So I told him like, you know, you know, I could get a record. I can get, I want to get a record out on you soon. That was Maddie, Puffy, Mr. C, and 50 Grand on that same documentary. Quote, from It Was All a Dream. You gotta talk to C, man, Big responded. Whatever C say. He put a lot of faith in C. C had shown himself to be a man of his word. C had wanted to re-record his demo to make it a little cleaner, and he did. C had said he'd get the demo to Maddie C at the source to try and get him placement in the magazine. And he did. And now C had him on the brink of a record deal. Big was loyal to people who were loyal to him. And now he and C were bonded at the hip forever. Big was not the type of person that was decisive on what he wanted to do, C told me. He really trusted me to make the best decision for him. C's decision was obvious. Sign with Puffy and Uptown and let him make Big a superstar. But the ultimate decision rested with Puffy's boss, Andre Harrell. Harrell, Combs, C, and Big linked up at Sylvia's soul food restaurant in Harlem a few weeks later. As short ribs and collard greens populated the table, Mr. C once again gave his greatest sales pitch for Biggie Smalls as the future of rap music. Big was more like Michigan J. Frog, the fictional cartoon character who'd only perform in front of certain people and appear mute in front of others. Harold hadn't seen anything that convinced him Big was the future of rap, but he'd give it one last shot. Something had to be there if Combs and Mr. C were vouching so hard for him. Yo, money, I want you to rhyme right now in the car, Harold said on the ride downtown from Sylvia's to the record label's offices in Midtown. Mr. C put on a beat from the cassette and Big took care of the rest. He unleashed a string of rhymes that damn near made Harold stop the car. Big wasn't the type of artist Harold originally envisioned for Uptown, but talent was talent. He promised Puffy he would draw up the paperwork and from there it would be on, end quote. After this meeting, things on the Uptown side got rolling. Puffy started setting up everything Big would need to make a full album, and he also set up cameo appearances on other people's albums that were already underway. Big could get money for the cameos, but the official paperwork on his career took time to put together. So Big had no steady income from his music. He still needed money to live. And then he finds out that his girlfriend, Jan, was pregnant. So his brain goes into overdrive on figuring out how he's going to provide for what he would find out was his daughter. About that same time, June 18th, 1992 to be exact, Big's good friend O is shot and killed by his own uncle in a drug-related beef. That is the closest I have come to an explanation of what went down that day. A drug-related beef. It was devastating for Big, but he still made a trip out to North Carolina to sell drugs. His rationale was providing for his child. He did not tell Puffy what he was doing. But Puffy gets word, and he contacts Biggie to tell him the deal is done. Quote, I know why you're going down there, nigga. You know this is only going to lead to jail or death. But you don't need to be down there. I just got a call from your lawyer. Deal's closed, man, exclaimed Combs. You can come by the office Tuesday morning. I got a check waiting for you, ready to cash, right here. The $125,000 Wallace was to receive was a lot of money, but it wasn't like he was set for life. There was studio time, and then there was pay-in for necessities, like finding the dopest producers, but it was the single biggest check that he'd seen at that time. Mr. C's lawyer negotiated the deal through his production company, but Big warned Puffy that this better be legit, because the money he was making in North Carolina was incredibly hard to turn away from. In the back of his mind, though, rattled a lingering thought that maybe he should pack up and head back north. The longer he stayed with crack in his pocket, the closer and closer he came to losing his freedom, or perhaps even his life. This is so crazy, and a lot of people don't even know this, but the day Puffy called me and told me the contracts would be there, I was going to leave Tuesday, but something told me, yo, just leave Monday, Big said later. 
Don't you know Monday night police ran up to the house we were staying in and locked them niggas up? That was a sign. He had been so close to his life effectively being over, and any semblance of a rap dream dying in a North Carolina jail cell. Big knew he had to focus on music full time, because there was no going back after this. It's what O had been telling him, and as far as he knew, that was O that got him out of the trap house in time. End quote. Things are getting started for Tupac and Chris, but there are more challenges for the up and coming rappers that we will get into in the episodes to come. If you like what you've heard today, please like, rate, review, and subscribe. If you want to contribute to the podcast or chat about the case, contact details, including the Patreon, are in the show notes. Biggie will see you out, and I will talk at you next time on It's All Relative. I was a terror since the public school era. Bathroom passes, cutting classes, squeezing asses. Smoking blunts was a daily routine since 13. A chubby nigga on the scene. I used to have the trade deuce and the deuce deuce in my bubble goose. Now I got the Mac in my knapsack, lounging black, smoking sacks up and axe and sidekicks with my sidekicks, rocking fly kicks. Honeys wanna chat, but all we wanna know is where the party at. And can I bring my cat? If not, I hope I don't get shot. Better throw my vest on my chest, cause niggas is a mess. It don't take nothing but front for me to start something. Bugging and bucking at niggas like I